everyone, welcome to the special CUBE Conversations here at Palo Alto's The Cube Studios. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE and The Cube. We're here with Devesh Garg, who's the founder and CEO of Arcus Inc., Arcus.com, A-R-R-C-U-S.com, and Steve Herod, general partner at, at General Canalyst, uh, VC, who's funded them. Congratulations on your launch. These guys launched on Monday, a hot new product, software OS for networking, powering white boxes and a whole new generation of potentially cloud computing. Welcome to this CUBE conversation. Congratulations on your launch. Thank you, John. So Devesh, talk about this, this startup. When you guys were founded, let's get to some of the specifics. The date you were founded, some of the people on the team, and the funding. Yeah, we were uh, formally incorporated in uh, February of 2016. Uh, we really got going in earnest in August of 2016 and have you know, chosen to stay in stealth. Uh, the, the founding team consists of myself, a gentleman by the name of Kayer Patel, uh, he's our CTO. We also have a gentleman by the name of Derek Young. Uh, he's our chief architect. And our backgrounds are a combination of uh, the semiconductor industry. I spent a lot of time in the semiconductor industry. Uh, most recently, I was president of EasyChip, and we sold that company to Mellanox. And Kayer and Derek, um, our networking protocol experts, uh, spent 20 plus years at places like Cisco. Uh, and arguably some of the best uh, protocol guys in the world. So the three of us got together uh, and basically uh, saw an opportunity uh, to, um, uh, to bring some of the uh, uh, insights and, and architectural innovation you know, we had in mind to the market. So you got some pedigree in there, some, some top talent. Absolutely. What are some of the things that they've done in the past from some notable notable? Yeah, I mean, you know, some, if, you, if you'd like some uh, just uh, high level uh, uh, numbers, uh, we have uh, 600 plus years of experience uh, of deep networking expertise within the company. Uh, our collective team has shipped over 400 products to production. Uh, we have over 200 uh, IETF RFC papers that have been filed by the team, as well as 150 plus patents. So we really uh, Looking focused- Looking good on the, on, the, on the pedigree for sure. Yeah, we absolutely focused on getting the best talent in the world uh, because we felt that it would be uh, a significant differentiation uh, to be able to start from a clean sheet of paper. And so really having people who have that expertise allowed us to kind of take a step back and you know, reimagine what could be possible with an operating system uh, and gave us the benefit of being able to you know, choose best in class approaches. What was the, uh, the point that this all came together? What was the guiding vision? Was it um, network OSs are going to be um, cloud-based, was it going to be more IOT? What was the, some of the founding principles that really got this going? Because clearly, we see a trend where you know, Intel's been dominating, we see what NVIDIA's doing competitively, certainly on the GPU side, you're seeing the white boxes become a trend, Google makes their own stuff, Apple's big making their own silicon. So you can, the, there's kind of a whole big scale world out there that has got a lot of hardware experience, what was the catalyst for you guys when you found this company? What was the guiding principle on all yeah, this? Yeah, I, I would say there were three, John, and you hit, you hit on uh, a couple of them in your reference to Intel and Nvi NVIDIA uh, with some of the innovation. But if I start at the top level, uh, the market. The networking market is a large market, and it's also very strategic um, and foundational in a hyper-connected world. Um, that market is also dominated by a few people. Uh, and uh, there's essentially three vertically integrated OEMs that dominate that market, and when you have uh, that type of dominance, it leads to ultimately high prices and muted innovation. So we felt, number one, the market was going through tremendous change, but at the same time, it had been tightly controlled by a few people. The other uh, part of it was that there was a tremendous amount of innovation that was happening at the silicon component level. Coming from the semiconductor industry, um, I was early at Broadcom, uh, very you know, involved in some of the networking things that happened in the early stages of the company, uh, we saw tremendous amounts of uh, innovation and feature velocity that was happening at the silicon component level. That in turn led to a lot of system hardware people coming into the market and producing systems based on this wide variety of choices for, um, you know, for the silicon. But the missing link was really an operating system that would unleash all that innovation. So Silicon Valley is back, Steve. You, you know, you're a VC now, but you were the CTO of VMware, one of the companies that actually changed how data centers operate, <coughs> certainly as a, certainly as a pretext of cloud computing and we're seeing with microservices and the growth of cloud. Um, Silicon's hot. IT operations is certainly being decimated as we all knew it in the past. 
everything's being automated away, you need more functionality, there's a demand. Mm -hmm. is, this, is this kind of how you see it? I mean, you always see things a little early as a, as a technologist, now VC. What got you excited about these guys? What's the, what's the bottom line? Yeah, maybe two points on that. So one, Silicon has is, is definitely become interesting again, if you will, in the, in the Silicon Valley area. And I think that's partly because cloud scale and web scale allows these environments where you can afford to put in new hardware and really take advantage of it. Um, I was a semiconductor guy first, actually too, so it's exciting for me to see that. But um, you know, as Devesh said, it's kind of a straightforward story, you know, especially in a world of whether it's cloud or IoT or everything, networking is you know, like literally the core to all of this working going forward. And uh, the opportunity to rethink it in a, in a new design and in a software first mentality uh, felt kind of perfect right now. And I think uh, I think Devesh even sold the team a little short, even as with all the numbers that are there. Um, KR, for instance, his co-founder was sort of, everyone you talk to will call him uh, Mr. BGP, which is one of the main routing yeah. protocols yeah. in the internet. So just a ridiculously deep team uh, trying to take this on. And there have been a, a few companies trying to do something kind of yeah. like this. And I think, uh, what do they say, the, the second mouse gets the cheese. Yeah. I, think, <laughs> I think we've seen some things that didn't work the first time around and we can really, I think, improve on them and have a chance to make a major impact on the networking market. You know, just to kind of go on a tangent here for a second, because you know, as you're talking, kind of my brain's kind of firing away because you know, one of the things I've been talking about on theCUBE a lot is ageism. And if you look at the movement of the cloud that's brought a systems mindset mm -hmm. back, if you look at all the best successes out there right now, it's, I won't say old guys and gals, but it's really systems people, people who understand networking and systems because the cloud is an operating system. You have an operating system for networking. So seeing that trend certainly happen, that's awesome. The question I have for you, Devesh, is, is what is the difference? What's the impact of this new network OS? Because I'm almost envisioning, if I think through my mind's eye, you got servers and serverless is certainly a big trend you're seeing in cloud. It's one resource pool, it's one operating system and that needs to have cohesiveness and connectedness through services, so is this how you guys are thinking about, how are you guys thinking about the network OS? What's different about what you guys are doing um, with Arc OS versus yeah. what's out there today? No, that's a great question, John. So in, in, terms, of, um, in terms of what we've done, um, the, the, the third piece you know, of uh, the puzzle, so to speak, when we were talking about our team, um, I talked a little bit about the market opportunity, I talked a little bit about the innovation that was happening at the semiconductor and uh, systems level and said the missing link was on the OS. And so, as I uh, said at the onset, we had the benefit of hiring some of the best people in the world. And what that gave us the opportunity was to look at um, the 20 plus years of development that had happened on the operating system side for networking and basically identify those things that really made sense. So, um, we had the benefit of being able to adopt what worked and then augment that with those things that were needed for a modern day networking infrastructure environment. Um, and so we set about producing a product, we call it ArcOS, and the, th the characteristics of it that are unique are that it's, uh, first of all, um, it's best in class protocols. We um, have minimal dependency on open source protocols, and the reason for that is that no serious network operator is going to put an open source networking protocol in the core of their network. They're just not going to risk their business and the efficacy and performance of their network for something like that. So we start with best in class protocols and then um, we captured them in a very open, modular, um, uh, services, uh, microservices based architecture. And um, that allows us the flexibility and the extensibility to be able to compose it in a manner that's consistent with what the end use case is going to be. So it's designed from the onset to be very scalable and very versatile in terms of where it can be deployed. We can deploy it um, you know, in a physical environment, we can deploy it vis-a-vis -a, -vis a, a container, or we could deploy it in the cloud. So we're agnostic to all of those use case scenarios. And then in addition to that, we knew that we had to make it usable. It makes no sense to have the best in class protocols if our end customers can't use them. So what we've done is we've adopted open config, Yang based models, and we have programmable APIs. So in any environment, people can leverage their existing tools, their existing applications, and they can um, relatively easily and efficiently uh, integrate Arc OS into their networking environment. And then similarly, we did the same thing on the hardware side. 
We have something that we call DPAL. It's a data plane adaptation layer. It's an intelligent HAL. And what that allows us to do is be hardware agnostic. So we're indifferent to what the underlying hardware is. Um, and what we want to do is be able to take advantage of the advancements in the silicon component level as well as at the system level and be able to deploy Arc OS anywhere. Okay, so let's take a step back. So you guys, so the, the protocol stuff's awesome. What's the uh, value proposition um, for Arc OS and who's the target audience? You mentioned data centers in the past. Is it data center operators? Is it developers? Is it um, service providers? Who is your target customer? Yeah, so, so the, the piece of the puzzle that wraps everything together is we wanted to do it at massive scale. And so we have the ability to support internet scale uh, with deep routing uh, capabilities within Arc OS. And as a byproduct of that, and all the other things that we've done architecturally, we're the world's first operating system that's been ported to the high-end Broadcom Strata DNX family. Uh, that product is called Jericho Plus in the marketplace. And as a byproduct of that, we can ingest a full internet routing table. And as a byproduct of that, we can be used in the highest end applications for network operators. Um, so performance is a key value proposition. Performance as measured by internet scale, as measured by convergence times, as measured by the amount of control, visibility, and access that we provide. And by virtue of being able to solve that high-end problem, it's very easy for us to come down. So in terms of your specific question about what are the use cases, we have active discussions in data center-centric applications for the leaf and spine. We have active discussions for edge applications. And we have active discussions going on for cloud-centric applications. Arcus can be used anywhere. So who's the buyer though? Is it network operator? So it sounds like you can go like a variety of, of personas. Network operator, large telco. That's right. Data so, center, person running a killer app that's you know, high mission critical, high scale. Is that my, getting that right? Yeah, you're, getting, you're absolutely getting it right. Basically anybody that has a network and has networking infrastructure that is consuming uh, networking equipment is a potential customer for ours. Now, the product has the extensibility to be used anywhere in the data center, at the edge, or in the cloud. Uh, we're very focused on um, some of the use cases uh, that are in the CDN peering uh, and IP, you know, route reflector IP peering use cases. Great, Steve. I want to get your thoughts because obviously I know how you invest. You guys have a great, great firm over there. You're pretty finicky on investments. Certainly, team check pedigrees mm -hmm. there uh, on the team. So that's a good, good sign. Yep. Market Tam, big markets. What's the market here for you? How do you see this market? Uh, what's the bet for you guys on the market side? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, as you look at the size of the networking market, with uh, you know three major players around here and, and you know a longer tail, um, owning a small piece of a giant market is a great way to get started. And if you believe in the in the um, secular trends that are going on with innovation and hardware and the ability to take advantage of them, I think we have identified a, a few really interesting starting use cases in web scale companies that have a lot of cost and needs in the networking side. But uh, what I love about the software architecture, it reminds me uh, a lot of things to do of kind of just even the early virtualization pieces. If you, if you can take advantage of movement in advantages in hardware as they improve and really bring them into a company more quickly than before, then those companies are going to be able to have um, you know, better economics on their networking early on. So get a great layer in, solve a particular use case, but then the trends of being able to take advantage of new hardware and to be able to provide the data and the APIs to program it and to manage it, uh, who wouldn't want that over And it's time. creative lim uh, limitless opportunity because with custom silicon that has you know, purpose-built protocols, it's easy to put a box together in a large data center or, cl or even boxes. Yeah, and you can so imagine the, the vendors of the advances in the chips really love that there's a good company that can take advantage of them more quickly than others can. So cloud, cloud service providers certainly is a target audience here. Large, the large clouds would love if there's an app coming in. Broadcom is a customer, are they a partner of you guys? They, they Part just uh, Broadcom's a partner. So we, uh, we've ported Arc OS onto um, multiple members of the Broadcom uh, switching family, so we have uh, five or six of their components, uh, their networking uh, system on chip components that we've ported to, including the two highest end, uh, which is the Jericho Plus and you got to love the, the Broadcom buying CA. 
<laughs> and that's going to open up IT operations to you guys and a whole new set of huh? applications. I mean, talk about what you just said, extensibility of taking what you just said about boxes and tying app high-end application performance. Yep. You almost can see that vertically integrated. Kind of I think I think developing. I, yeah, from from a semiconductor perspective, since I spent a lot of time in the industry, you know, one of the challenges I, I had founded uh, a high core count uh, multi processor company, and one of the challenges we always had was the software. And at EasyChip, uh, we had the world's highest end network processor. The challenge was software, and I think if you take all of the innovation in the silicon industry and couple it with the right software, the combination of those two things opens up a vast number of opportunities. And we feel that with Arc OS, we provide you know, that software piece that's going to help people take advantage of all the great innovation that's happening you in semiconductors. You mentioned earlier open source, people don't want to bring open source into the core of the network, yet the open source uh, communities are growing really at an exponential rate. You're starting to see open source be the lingua franca for all developers, especially the modern software developers. Why not open source in the core? You, I mean, obviously it's got to be bulletproof, you need security, obviously the answer's there, but um, that seems antithetical to the trend on open source. What's the, what's the answer there on, on why not open source in the core? Yeah, so <clears throat> we, we take advantage uh, of open source where it makes sense. So we take advantage of open N, uh, ONL, Open Network Linux, uh, and we have developed our protocols that run on that environment. Uh, the reason we feel that um, the protocols uh, being developed in-house as opposed to leveraging things from uh, the open source community are the internet scale, multi-threading of BGP, mm -hmm. integrating things like open config, Yang-based models into that environment. They're proven. Right, well it's not only proven, but the, the, um, the capabilities that we're able to innovate on and bring unique differentiation weren't really going back to a clean sheet of paper, and so we designed it ground up to really be optimized for the needs of today. Steve, your old boss, Paul Moritz, used to talk about the hardened top. Mm -hmm. Similar here, right? You, no one really, no one's really going to care if it works great. <laughs> if it's under the, under the hardened top where you use open source as a connection point for services and um, opportunities to grow. Is that a similar concept? It is, I mean, at the end of the day, open source is great for, for certain things and for community and extensibility and for visibility. And then um, it, on the flip side, they look to a company that's accountable and for making sure it performs and is high quality. And so I think, I think the modern way for, especially for the mission critical infrastructure is to have a mix of both and to give back to the community where it makes sense to be responsible for hardening things or building them when they don't exist. So, how'd you how'd you how'd you land these guys? You get them early and don't said don't talk to any other VCs. <laughs> um, how did it all come together between um, you guys? Uh, I, we've actually been friends for a while, which has been great. And at one point, we actually decided to ask, "Hey, what do you actually do?" <laughs> <laughs> I found out I was a venture investor, and he was a network uh, engineer. But no, I actually have um, I, I actually really like the networking space as a whole. Yeah. As much as people talk about the cloud or open source or storage mm -hmm. being tough. Uh, networking is literally everywhere and will be everywhere in whatever our world looks like. So I've always been looking for the most interesting companies in that space. And uh, we, we always joke like the investment world, kind of San Francisco's applications, yeah. mid here is sort of operating systems and the lower you get, the more technical it gets. And so Well there's a swing is, back, I mean, is, uh, I mean we're a media company, I think we're doing things different as we were saying before we came on camera, but yeah. you know, I think media is undervalued. I wrote, just wrote a tweet on that, got some traction on that, but it, it's shifting back to silicon, you're seeing systems. Yeah. If you look at some of the hottest areas, IT operations is being automated away, AI ops, um, you know, auto machine learning, you're starting to see some of these high end, I call them systems like. That's exactly where I was going to go. It's like, the, I, I especially just love very deep intellectual property that is hard to replicate and that you can, you know, ultimately you can charge a premium for something that is that hard to do. And so that's that's really something I get drawn to. So who to else is the in the time. deal within you guys? Do you have any other syndicates in the, uh, in the you deal? You talk about some of the. Sure, folks? you know, so our, our initial uh, uh, seed investor was Clear Ventures. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Chris Rust is on our board. Um, and then uh, Steve uh, uh, came in and led our uh, most recent round of funding and he also is on the board. What we've done uh, beyond that institutional money is we have a group of very strategic individual investors. Uh, two people I would maybe highlight uh, amongst the vast number of advisors we have are a gentleman by the name of Pankaj Patel. Uh, Pankaj was the chief development officer at Cisco. He was basically number two at Cisco for a number of years deep uh, operating um, experience across all facets mm -hmm. of what we would need. And then there's another gentleman by the name of Amarjeet Gill. I've been friends with Amarjeet for 30 years. He's probably one of the single most 
uh, successful entrepreneurs uh, in the Valley. He's incubated companies that have uh, been purchased by Broadcom, by Apple, by Google, by Facebook, by Intel, uh, by EMC. Uh, so we were uh, fortunate enough to get him involved and keep him busy. Great yeah. pedigree, great investors with that kind of intellectual property and those smart minds there. A lot of pressure on you as the CEO not to screw it up, right? I mean, come on now, you got all those smart come on, people. Man. Come on, <laughs> okay, you got it looking yeah, really no, good. You know, I, um, <laughs> I, I welcome it actually. I, I, I enjoy it. You know, we, look, uh, when you have a great team and you have as many capable people surrounding mm -hmm. you, um, it really comes together. And so I don't think it's about me. I actually think, number one, it's about the team. I was team. just kidding, by the way. <laughs> I think it's about the team, and I'm merely a spokesperson to represent all the great work that our team has done. So I'm really proud of the guys we have. Um, and frankly, it makes my job easier. So. Yeah, you got a lot of people to tap for, for advice, certainly the shared experiences. Yeah. Collectively in the different areas make a lot of sense, and the investors certainly yeah. top tier. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's not, it's not just at the, at the board, it's just not at the investor level, it's at the advisor level, and uh, also at, uh, you know, at our individual team members. When we have a team that executes as well as we have, you know, everything falls into place. Well, we think the software world's changing, we think the economics are changing, certainly when you look at cloud, whether it's cloud computing or token economics with blockchain and new emerging tech around AI, we think the world is certainly going to change. Um, so you guys got a great team to kind of figure it out. I mean, you got to you know, execute in real time. You got a real technology play with IP. Um, question is, what's the next step? What's your priorities now that you're out there? Congratulations on your launch. Thank you. Uh, in stealth mode, you got some customers, you got Broadcom relationship looking out in the landscape. What's your, uh, what's your plan for the next year? What's your goals? Really to take uh, every facet of what you said and just scale the business. You know, we're actively hiring. Um, we have uh, a lot of customer activity. Uh, this week happens to be uh, the most recent IETF uh, conference that happened in Montreal. Uh, given our uh, company launch on Monday, there's been a tremendous amount of interest in everything that we're doing. Uh, so uh, that coupled with the existing customer discussions we have is only going to expand. Uh, and then we have a very robust roadmap uh, to continue to augment and add capabilities to the baseline capabilities that we brought to the market. So I, I really view uh, the next year as um, scaling the business in all aspects and uh, increasingly my time is going to be focused on commercially centric activities. Great, well congratulations, you got a great team. Exciting Thank you very much. Achieve. Great investment. Cube Conversation here, I'm John Furrier here, the hot startup here, launching this week here in California, in Silicon Valley, where silicon is back and software is back. It's theCUBE bringing you all the action. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching.